We're live here from Casa Bonarotti in Florence at the show Artemisia in the Museum of Michelangelo. My name is Linda Falcone and on behalf of Calliope Arts and Casa Bonarotti, I'm so happy to welcome you here today to see the show that inaugurated this morning. I'm here with Elizabeth Cropper, art historian, author, Dean Emerita of the National Gallery, the, the Center of Advanced Study at the National Gallery of Washington in the US. You're here for the opening <laughs> of the show, and uh, we're very privileged to have you here today, Elizabeth. Well, thank you, Linda, and it's just such a pleasure for me to be here. I'm so happy I could be here because it's a jewel of a show, and um, it's a very small exhibition, but it's quintessentially Artemisia and very much about this place, the Casa Buonarroti, which was so important to her. Yes, <laughs> yes, we, we're, we're looking at Artemisia in Florence, which on some level is a lesser studied part of her life. And hopefully tonight we can introduce our guests into the world of Baroque Florence through Artemisia. We have a wonderful uh, painting here that will take us directly into Artemisia in the 1616, 1620. Um, what, what can you tell us, Elizabeth, about this painting at first glance? I think it's wonderful that the visitor comes in and just is immediately confronted with this because, in fact, chronologically, it doesn't belong at the beginning, it belongs at the end, but we're leading to the inclination. Yes. And, uh, this is a work, I think, that fulfills all the promise of the inclination, but it's a work of her maturity in Florence. And I'm very, very happy it's here because I think it presents Artemisia's ambitions to have such a large, single female figure filling the space of a large canvas and also right up against the surface of the canvas. There's no real depth of space where projected right into the figure and her suffering. And I, th yes. So this is the penitent Mary Magdalene. Yes. And she is at the center of the canvas, the heroines that Artemisia often put in the center. And, and there's this drama. So what are, we, what are we seeing? What is actually being represented? Well, we're seeing a woman figured as the Magdalene. And uh, she's wearing contemporary 17th century dress. She's wearing a very beautiful, expensive yellow silk uh, garment. She's obviously in a very uh, luxurious setting. She has a comfortable velvet covered chair. So she's a contemporary woman, but she's also expressing the emotions of the Magdalene who turns away from the mirror that you can see there where it just catches the pearl of her earring and turning away with her eyes rolling upwards to heaven as she turns away, and here's her little ointment jar, which is a key to the identity of the Magdalene. And we see behind the mirror a skull. And that, of course, is a sense of mortality, of the vanity of human life. And we see her turning away from vain things and from the things of the flesh and the things of the world. And as she does it, you see her here holding her breast. And what I think is so extraordinary about this is that she makes the Magdalene into a really suffering figure. And Artemisia has understood at this point that the suffering of the spirit is also a physical suffering of the body. Yes. And she's so capable of expressing that. And we see her bare feet. Yes. 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 <laughs> she's right. alone. Yes. She's moving away from the world of society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this, do you think, a self-portrait? It's, it's a trick question because it's <laughs> always you. difficult. They didn't, in this time period, it, it wasn't that artists necessarily used that terminology, um, but is it possible that it could have been an idealized self-portrait of Artemisia? Was she putting herself in some way in this canvas? I think that's two questions. Was she putting herself into the canvas and does it represent her? Um, I think it's 
resembles her, actually. Yeah. We have other images of her um, with the, her, the hair, sort of shaggy hair around here. Of course, that was the style of the moment. But I think in Florence, uh, in this second decade, which is such an exciting one in Florence, the fact that she was a woman and she was a painter and she was capable of representing women's suffering meant that the audience for this work really saw it as a self-identification. And that added to the excitement of looking at it. Yes. I think I might just add that, um, as you know, theatre and opera are very, very lively and important in Florence at this time. And we have famous women who are supported by the Medici, like Francesca Caccini and Virginia Andreini. And so the notion of role playing and of performing a part is something that people are very familiar with and in fact enjoy that yes. level of identification. And I think that's what's happening here. Yes, it's very, very... Um, it, it, you feel like you're in the room yes. with her and yes. that is why it's so exciting to have the exhibition open because through this painting we enter into her world I, I wanted to actually ask about a detail, yes. uh, particularly the name. You mm -hmm. see this beautiful gilt yes. writing, yes. This, a specialized writing of Artemisia Lomi. Yes. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about this signature of sorts? <laughs> well, I think people who have studied this work in the past have all been a little bit stumped by it because unfortunately we don't have as close a scientific analysis of this painting as we do of the Inclinazione. But um, it has, I think, been argued that this is written on an inserted piece of canvas. Whether it is or not, it's certainly not by Artemisia. It's obviously, we can look at her handwriting in the next room. It's written with a real calligraphy, uh, uh, calligraphic style, um, with lots of curly cues and additions as is the inscription, uh, she chose the better part, optimum parte elegit, which comes from the Gospel of St. Luke. But both of these are obviously written by professional calligraphers. Many artists could do this, but I don't think Artemisia had the training to do this. Right. So just really quickly, so we can understand, she mm. chose the better part, refers to the Magdalene, who was shunning her worldly pleasures, her worldly life, and entering into a more contemplative, spiritual, and, spiritual yes. existence. Okay. But, but the last name itself, mm. um, because we know that Artemisia was Tuscan, we know she came from Rome to Florence to create, we might say, a different life for mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. And can you link us back to the name yes. and what that would have meant? Yes. Her. Actually, one small comment, which is that Artemisia here is spelt with an I in the middle, which is interesting to me because she didn't spell it that way, so yeah. that may mean something. But Lomi was her maternal, uh, excuse me, paternal uh, family name. Right. Both her father, obviously, and his brother were orphaned at an early age in Pisa. And they went to Rome, and Orazio decided to stay in Rome and take the surname of his uncle, whereas Aurelio went back to Pisa and Florence and remained a Lomi. So they were brothers, but they took different surnames in adult life. It's yes. complicated. Yes. <laughs> but it is very important that when Artemisia comes to Florence, in so many ways, she is claiming her Tuscan identity, um, her wedding contract, which is signed in Rome, even states that she is to be treated as if she is in Florence and as if the document is taking place in France or is being signed in Florence. So she had a special connection with the city, yes. which actually was very much to her advantage when she came here. We're going to see how and why mm -hmm. um, throughout the show. And I, I just want to sort of, before we move on to a document that is really important for us to see, I, I just want the audience to realize that this painting is normally at the Pity Palace, so uh, the Uffizi Gallery collection, 
and it's usually exhibited really yes. high up. So this is an extraordinary opportunity to see it close up. Um, this is linked to the whole idea of Artemisia up close, which is what we were trying to do with the project, um, linked to the restoration. And, and if you are in Florence, and this is my public service <laughs> message, for those of you in Florence, do come to the show, do come to see the Magdalene close up. Um, as well as the inclination, because it's a really special opportunity. Uh, Elizabeth, I wanted to invite you to talk to yes. us about this next document, um, which is really special, and you can you can introduce yes. us to it directly. Yes. We see Artemisia's life being documented, so this is a key element. Yes, I mean it, it, these are documents that scholars know intimately, but in print rather than often uh, in face-to-face. In -face. This document comes from the Archivio di Stato. Most of the documents here belong to the Archivio Bonarotti. But this is the document, very, very often cited, which documents Artemisia's entry into the Accademia del Disegno um, in 1616. And you see here, it says, if you can just see it with a camera, Artemisia Donna di Pierantono Stiatesi, that was the name of her husband, e filiola di Orazio Lomi. And in fact, it's really much more important here that she is the daughter of Orazio than the, uh, the wife of, um, of Stiatesi. And it documents her matriculation into the Academia del Disegno. And um, this is an organization which I would say is tremendously important uh, in Florence at the moment, in the, in the early 17th century. But it was created by Cosimo Primo de Medici. So it's a Medici structure which was uh, there both to educate artists in order to make sure that the tradition of Michelangelo would continue, the tradition of excellence in Florence, but it also took on various guild functions and acted as a court. And in fact, one of the reasons why Artemisia needed to be part of this organization was to guarantee her legal status, because there are many, many documents, um, and there are probably more than we know of, where she's being brought to court at the Academia for non-payment of debts or because she needs support. Um, and it's a, it's a tremendously important organization to which Galileo also belonged. Yes. And Galileo had joined uh, the Academia three years before Artemisia. Some people find it strange that Galileo would be a member of the Academia del Disegno, but in fact, Disegno included all forms of drawing. It included military geometry and uh, very importantly, shadow projection. And in fact, mathematics was taught at the Academia del Disegno. And several of uh, Galileo's pupils were also members. So Disegno is an all-encompassing idea, as we know, mm -hmm. uh, from Vasari's discussion of Michelangelo and the arts of disegno, yes. which this house celebrates. Yes, yeah. I, it's, it's interesting because you, if, if we think of Artemisia as the first woman painter to receive this honor yes. that we're seeing documented yeah. in, this, in this book, right, from the Academia, uh, I'm sorry, from the um, Archivio di Stato, from the State Archive. And she was newly newly literate, I mean, she was, she had learned to write around this time, yes. and suddenly she's finding herself with the greatest minds of the time. Yes. So Galileo is one example, Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger is another example. And I, I'm interested, and, and this is something that you can answer as we walk through yes. the exhibition, but I think a key question for our audience as well is, how did this woman do it? <laughs> yes. Right? And probably the next document will help us 
understand <laughs> Artemisia's connection and the art of connection because her skill as an artist in order to really understand Artemisia has to be accompanied with a study of her ability uh, to diplomatically form relationships. Yes. Um, can you show us the sure. next... Um, and of course, before the, we do yeah. that, we should just note here that yes. this painting really demonstrates how well she accommodated her style, learned from her father and Caravaggio, into this greater elegance, in a way, of contemporary painters in Florence, including Cristofano Allori and Cigoli and so on. So this is a really quintessential Florentine painting because it brings all that together in Artemisia's career. But, but you're right. Um, I'll just take it. Even though we can explain how she did it, it's still remarkable that she did it. Yes. Uh, because growing up as an orphan child, at least without a mother at home, and having to take care of her younger brothers, uh, she herself says at one point that she could barely read or write when she was in Rome. But clearly, she learned uh, to read and to write. Uh, she didn't write as well as Galileo, but she could read and write. And um, her father and her family really did make use of their Florentine and Medicean connections. We have a letter from Orazio to Christina, the Grand Duchess, uh, in, in, before she comes to uh, Florence in 1612, saying that Artemisia has been painting well for five years and he wants to recommend Artemisia uh, to the court. So there's quite a bit of preparation uh, socially mm -hmm. for her to get here. I just want to stop you for one yes. minute and tell our audience, because those of you who saw the restoration conversation at Museo Galileo, yes. we, we talked quite a bit about Christina de Lorraine and her relationship with Galileo and their correspondence. So in this case, we have Orazio writing to Christina of Lorraine to, to get her favor on some level, yes. you know, to, to establish Artemisia as a professional painter at this point. Yes. She was young. She was yes. in her early 20s, yes. 21, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Um, so what are we actually seeing within this document proper? Well, this document, which um, our audience should know, is, is another quite famous letter from Andrea Cioli, who was the Medici uh, secretary, written from Florence to Piero Guicciardini, who's in Rome. And he's the Florentine ambassador in Rome. And he's writing um, at the beginning of, uh, of really 1615 to find out what the um, Florentine ambassador has to say about Artemisia's father. And um, he says that Artemisia is doing really well here, and she obviously is an outstanding artist, and therefore perhaps her father also would be uh, you know, worth having around. But he says before he does that, he wants to have her have it be absolutely certificata. He wants to be sure that if they bring this man to Florence, that it will be um, a good thing, that, that he will be an asset uh, to the court. And uh, the letter that we don't have here is the response from Guicciardini um, in Rome, who says, no, I wouldn't bother if I were you. He's not that terrific. He's a bit too diligent. He does some nice things, painting on alabaster, um, but it doesn't really add up to a lot uh, to bring him. And in another letter, uh, he also mentions Orazio's temper and his bad behavior. And it is interesting that um, socially in Rome, the Gentileschis were living a rather um, uncertain and uh, certainly sort of complicated urban life. And what is remarkable is that Artemisia comes to Florence. She has this husband. Uh, she had to marry before she came here. And his family is Florentine. Her father-in-law is a tailor. And so we know that he was able to supply her with silks and velvets and help her for costumes uh, for her paintings. But um, they are not of the courtly class. They're not aristocratic. And so what is extraordinary is that Artemisia seems to manage uh, to make herself into a presence 
not only just as an artisan, but as an artist and as, as, a, as a woman at court. And that takes some doing. <laughs> <laughs> most definitely, most definitely. And it's the diplomacy that's yes. interesting. No. And, and I think intelligence, you know, yeah. just absolute intelligence. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so speaking of courtly painting, um, I, I, I want to stop here next. And here we're looking at Cosimo II, yes. which is the son of Christine de Lorraine, just so we can yes. keep it all in the <laughs> family. Right? Yes. Um, and a, a, an enlightened patron yes. and, and very much a fan of Artemisia and supportive of her in several instances. Yes. So with this painting, which is from the Corsini Gallery, and, and I, I just want to give a shout out to exhibition curator um, Alessandro Cecchi, who is also the director of the museum, and really his ability to put together these works that are Florentine, um, you know, not seen yes. normally. This is in a private collection, the Corsini collection. So it's very yes. interesting for us um, in Florence to, to have an alternative view of these figures that to the Florentine, Cosimo II is obviously familiar. We know he's a great supporter of Galileo, etc. Yes. So following on your idea, right, of Artemisia becoming a, a court painter to some extent, right, to, or having a relationship with the Medici court in this case, what, what can you tell us about this patron and how was his role important for Artemisia? Mm. Well, um, this is a wonderful portrait and I didn't know it before and of course it's painted quite soon before he dies and, and one of the very sad things about um, uh, Cosimo is that he had tuber we think he had tuberculosis and he was at least not healthy for much of his life and he died when he was 31. Yeah. Um, so we have to imagine that uh, Cosimo and Artemisia are very close in age. I think she's just three years younger than him. So it's a kind of a young court, but it's also one that's somewhat debilitated because of his health. Mm -hmm. But you're right, he was very well educated and his mother had Galileo teaching him mathematics and he became tremendously interested in scientific instruments of all kinds and military instruments of all kinds. And the court between um, his mother and his wife, Maria Maddalena, which has made many people think this picture was painted perhaps as a commission from Cosimo to give to his wife. Yeah, you, you're referring back to the Magdalene. Yes. Okay, so that the Magdalene was possibly, possibly inspired for, by... Uh, for, for Cosimo, for his wife, whose okay. name was Mary Magdalene. Okay. And so that's an interesting possibility. It's such an ambitious picture yeah. that it might have been for a very important person. Yes. Um, yes. But um, so he's very, very cultivated and he's, he's interested in music, he's interested in opera, um, theater, books. Um, and Artemisia writes to him on occasions, often not very good occasions because she wants to leave town without finishing work for him. But she does write to him directly and so one has to see that there was a, there was obviously, you know, a hierarchy there, but he was tremendously interested in all aspects of Florentine culture uh, and, and fostered it in the brief life he was given. And, and Casa Bonarotti in this sense of, of being a salon for culture, and I'd even say it continues as a yes. salon for culture today yes. in Florence, which is what makes it so exciting. Um, but, but this whole environment of peers, even from different levels of society, different levels of knowledge, uh, that somehow in this period they were coming together and entering into a conversation, yes. um, it actually, I would even go so far as to suggest that that was his legacy. Yes. Um, you know, his, his love and his affection, you know, I'm... I don't know if it's hyperbole, you can tell me if it's hyperbole, but in any case, his respect for these different figures. Um, we can talk about Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger, Artemisia, Galileo. Um, 
who were fellows on some level yes. and, and certainly responded to each other in, in many ways. I wanted to, to take you um, to see this, uh, another wonderful portrait uh, by Cristofano Alori, and an, Alori is another, <laughs> another peer yes. right, of Artemisia, and perhaps even in the Magdalene, she's responding to him and, mm -hmm. and referencing him. But l let's come directly to Casa Buonarroti, because this is where the show is. Um, but this element of the, of the exhibition, the temporary exhibition, is very, well, is very well linked to the history of the place. So here we have um, the, the key figure in, in Artemisia's initial Florentine life. Yes. Um, well, he, he took his uh, ancestry very seriously. <laughs> and um, he was in, I mean, he was a poet. He wrote a lot of poetry. He wrote a lot of um, verse for intermezzi, for theatrical productions at court. Uh, and he had a lot of friends. And he really um, supported his friends. Uh, he engaged them in this place and in his ideas for the decoration of the place. Uh, he had several of them working on the Latin inscriptions that began uh, his thinking about the imagery. Uh, and he obviously in a way is picking up themes from Vasari, from you know, the Vasari's second edition in 1568 has a life of Michelangelo mm -hmm. and it's where the sort of apotheosis in a way of Michelangelo begins and I think Michelangelo Buonarroti the younger saw himself continuing uh, that projection forward uh, both for the arts but also for Florence and and for the Medici so yeah I think mm -hmm. it's I think it's important to um, think about the fact that Casa Buonarroti was the first home museum dedicated to an artist. So it was the first in Italian, Casa della Memoria, right? Yes. Or the house of memory for an artist. And this is directly linked to Vasari and to his concepts for the Academia delle Arti del Disegno. Because as you were saying before, the, the, the Academy had a guild function, right? So before, the Academy, artists were considered artisans. Mm -hmm. And with Michelangelo the Divine, there was this idea of, artisan, of artists actually being creators in their own right yes. and that they could become yes. men of letters as well, right? Um, so you have Michelangelo the Younger trying to further Michelangelo the Divine's memory and create Michelangelo the Divine. Yes. You know. Um, of course, what he, what he brings to that also is poetry, because for Vasari, it was painting, sculpture, and architecture. But for Michelangelo Buonarroti, it was also Michelangelo the great poet. And so he's working at this time to put together the first edition of Michelangelo's poetry. So there's a fourth crown yes. um, provided by the poetry. Yes. Yeah. We're going to go now to see the, 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 the purpose of the <laughs> exhibition, right? Which yes. is uh, Artemisia's Allegory of Inclination, uh, which has just been restored uh, by conservator Elizabeth Wicks um, as part of the project Artemisia Up Close, which includes this exhibition, uh, sponsored by Calliope Arts and Christian Levitt. It's been a year-long process, and I just want to say we started on September 27th, oh, how 2022, <laughs> and yeah. today we inaugurate the show on September 27th, 2023. So it has been an amazing year um, for Casa Buonarroti and of, of research and of recovery of Artemisia's al allegory of inclination, also the story surrounding it. Um, so I, I'm just trying to create a little yes. bit of su suspense, suspense 
Um, because the painting is, is phenomenal. Phenomenal, yeah. exactly. Before we go in, um, I just would ask if Alessandro, who's behind the camera, could get a general view of the room. Um, we have a, a video in this first room, and you and I will start okay. our, our walk um, to see the allegory of inclination, and you can tell us a little bit about what that means, <laughs> right? Yes. And, and what significance the painting had. So here she is. Here she is, as nobody has ever seen her for hundreds of years, exactly. <laughs> which is remarkable. Exactly. Um, because uh, this work, The Inclination, painted by Artemisia at Michelangelo Buonarroti's The Younger's Invitation, uh, belongs to this house and belongs to the ceiling of the so-called Galleria or gallery that uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger dedicated to the life and the qualities of his great uncle. Mm. And I know we want to look at the picture, but just to locate it okay. first for all of you. Okay. Um, this is a wonderful shot of the whole ceiling that we should all have committed to memory. And you can see that up here on the right, slightly pulled out, is the inclination, which is what we're seeing. And then on the left, there's a, each of these are paired. And on the left, we have the figure of ingenio or genius, which was done by Francesco Bianchi Buonavita, who was a pupil of Billivert's. And the center panel, we won't go through all of this, but this celebrates the placement of Michelangelo's bust on his monument in Santa Croce. So that's another part of the celebration of Michelangelo's Florentine genius. Um, Inclination, yes. Elizabeth, just, I'm just going to stop you. Yes. Um, because I think it's important, before we, we enter directly into mm -hmm. this, uh, this attribute, um, w what we're actually looking at is the ceiling of the gallery. Mm -hmm. um, these are canvases, as yes. you can see here. They're not frescoes, although they are on the gallery. Uh, they actually are all in need of restoration, just, <laughs> just to be aware. Um, and. I, I, before we look at the different at the different attributes, um, I want mm -hmm. just to take a look at the central painting yes. because I think that this really you were mentioning Michelangelo the Younger adding poetry okay. as yes. one of the arts that Mich of which Michelangelo the Divine was a master. Um, we also have architecture, sculpture, and painting. Yes. Right, but this is his divinization you could say. He's being crowned mm -hmm. by the allegories. Yeah. So could you just give us a real quick overview of, of what the gallery ceiling is? Well, one thing, I mean, in short, yes, it's a celebration of the, of the genius of Michelangelo and of his life. And in a way, it's a visualization of uh, his reputation. It's not just his works. We don't see a picture of the Sistine ceiling or anything like that. It's all the events in, in which he's celebrated or raised up or received by fame. It's a celebration. And in certain ways, and I, I do say this in my essay for the catalogue, which we can talk about, but um, it's, it's very closely related to the funeral of Michelangelo, which took place in uh, 1564 in which members of the Academia uh, del Disegno got together, mm -hmm. there it is, there it is. to um, paint allegories of Michelangelo's qualities, uh, of his attributes, if you like, his moderation, his honor, his love for his country. Uh, all of these qualities, most of them do appear in the funeral of Michelangelo. Inclination does not. Uh, it was not there. It was not a concept that had been really solidified uh, at that point. And so we don't find it in the funeral, mm. and we don't find it in the most relied upon 
uh, emblem book, if you like, for painters, uh, Cesare Ripa's Iconologia. We don't find it there until after this is painted. So when uh, Buonarroti the Younger decides to ask Artemisia, he's making something up uh, for himself in a very original way. So there's a reference book, which mm -hmm. is Cesare Ripa's Iconology. Iconology. Yeah. Iconologia. Yeah. Yes. And artists would refer to this reference book when they wanted to paint a certain allegory. If they, yes, if they were literate and they were working in a literate way and painting allegorical images, they would often use it. It was made for them. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and, but we don't see the inclination. And so what is Michelangelo yeah. the Younger shooting for <laughs> in this yeah. allegory? Well, first of all, I, sh I should say that the idea of inclination is a very important one in 16th and 17th century culture. And it becomes more important as the 17th century goes on. And it ends up, in a way, linking in the 18th century to ideas of taste and talent and so on. It means, if you say, it's very much like saying, I'm, I'm inclined towards something. Mm -hmm. means I have a, a strong feeling to want to do it. Uh, and people around 1600 talk about an inclinazione for going hunting or for building a palace or, you know, something you really, really like to do mm -hmm. and that you actually have more or less born within you. It's innate. Uh, your inclination is something you can encourage, you can follow, you can fight it. Uh, many young artists were made to fight it by their by their parents when they Michelangelo to. himself. Michelangelo no, himself. they tried to beat it out of him. Beat it out His of him. Tried to but beat inclination him. will out. Yeah. So it's it's a an in ingrown in bed inbred tendency towards something. So mm -hmm. this, in in my mind, mm -hmm. is similar in terms of features and and. Uh, look to the Magdalene. I, I yes. see something yes. of Artemisia. Oh, yes. Uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so is she, do you think, is she representing herself as the inclination to produce art? Because in this case, for Michelangelo the Divine, it was the inclination to produce art, the inclination, yes. the inclination to create. Yes, I think she really was, and I think that's why he wanted her to do it. And we should, we should always remember that um, these things come in pairs. So inclination needs to have a partner in genius. So you have ingenio, which will help you, as this image does, towards all kinds of um, knowledge. Mm -hmm. But inclination will lead you in a different way by your instincts, also towards the truth, however, because she's turning towards the star out there, uh, which I believe and hope is true, uh, is the North Star. And it's the star to which uh, sailors turn, it's the star that plots uh, the, the true direction. And so in a way, both Ingenio and Inclinazione have to do with ways of finding the truth, but they need to be combined together. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm silent because I'm thinking about what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry to be thinking. <laughs> uh, with regards to truth, and I know that there's a quote, you know, naked as the truth or the naked truth. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, she was painted naked. Yes. Right. Well, well we yes. think we think she was painted naked. we we could talk about that. We could talk about that. <laughs> that would be a two hour show, right? Um, but this this veil is not original. Right. Right. This veil was was um, produced after Artemisia painted the yes. inclination. This is by Ivo Terano and part of the um, Artemisia up close project was actually to reveal virtually what is behind the veil through yes. scientific 
uh, through restoration science. Um, so why, I, I just want you to just give us a real brief description. We're not going to talk about the restoration proper, no, no, no. but I, I certainly would invite our viewers to, um, for example, go on the Calliope Arts website and look at all of the various yes. updates of the restoration that um, were, were taken throughout the one year mm -hmm. um, that we worked with, with mm -hmm. that particular element. So can you just give us a, a, a couple of um, ideas why she would have been covered up? We're going to talk about it later as well, yes. but and just a sort of overview. Well, um, I'd also like to talk about why she was nude in the first place. Yes, maybe, but please. <laughs> well, please. we will in a moment have the opportunity to look over here at the copy of Baldinucci where the covering up yeah. is discussed yes. and which happened later in the century after Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger had died. Yes. Um, Buonarroti in the uh, description of this figure in his notes and he, as everybody knows, you certainly know, he wrote copious notes for these figures and how he wanted them to be and fortunately they're all here in this place uh, in the Archivio. But he says, uh, quite early on in his thinking, sia nuda, he wants it to be nude, he wants it to be a nude figure. Um, you could argue that that means completely nude. You could also argue, uh, I mean, a bare-breasted woman is a very familiar sight uh, in many allegories. If, if you go to the Uffizi and look at the ceilings, you'll see lots of personifications of women with bare breasts, but a completely nude figure would be very unusual, although I was thinking today about the times of day in the Medici Chapel and, you know, surely we have nudity there, but maybe a statue is different from a painting. Whatever, she's almost nude, <laughs> let's say, um, because we're not going to be able to take all this off, we don't want to, um, and we can, we can speculate. But she must be nude because she is true. She is also beautiful. He says she should be young and she should be beautiful and she should be um, enthusiastic. And we look at her face here and it, it is actually just a step away from the Magdalene. You're, you're right, Linda. I mean, it's, the woman is obviously more mature in there. But the way the eyes are illuminated, that wonderful way of making the eyes watery, a little bit of teeth, which is very unusual, which we see there. And, um, and then also this just wonderful hair, which is really like something out of Botticelli and uh, maybe something that she was, that she was thinking about. Um, but she's in the final painting, she's carried upwards, of course, because inclination rises towards the pole star by these clouds, uh, which just carry her upwards. And one thing that's happened in the cleaning is they've become beautifully bright and puffy and supportive. Um, yes. She's guided, of course, by the bussola or mariner's compass uh, that she holds. And would you like me to say a little bit about that now? Should we talk about sure, the compass? Sure, sure. Um, I just want you to turn to a little bit this yes. way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, the, the bussola, which, which uh, Michelangelo Bonarotti specifies. So, sorry, yes. the bussola for those, of us, for those of us who are learning Italian <laughs> is the mariner's compass. Yes. Okay. Otherwise known as a magnetic compass. And uh, it always turns towards the true north. And of course, um, when sailors can't sail by the stars, if it's cloudy, uh, bad weather, they can sail with, with the compass. Um, we all learned to use compasses when we were children to go on long hikes. Um, but this is a mariner's compass, and it's a very simple object. It's quite a big one so that it's conspicuous. Probably, uh, it's made of wood or maybe brass, it's not clear. And you can just see in the middle of it at the top, um, the pin, the spindle that holds uh, the versarium or the, uh, the, the, the mag magnetized needle that, that turns with the compass. And it means that it, it turns 
voluntarily of its own accord towards the star. And it's very important that we're not talking about sort of deliberate agency on the part of Artemisia or the artist, Michelangelo, whatever. It's something that will of itself be drawn towards the North Star, to the truth. Mm. And um, we know that in Bologna, much later, the Caracci family would use the um, Great Bear and the Pole Star as their emblem because they too wanted to seek uh, the truth in their work. Um, but this is, um, this is a very different kind of idea of inclination from the idea of dropping things from the Tower of Pisa or wondering whether they fall in the same speed and all of this. It's a question of magnetism. And um, I think it's really important to say that magnetism was something that everybody in Florence was really interested at this moment, this from Galileo to Cosimo and obviously Michelangelo Buonarroti. Um, and so it's, it's a unique image but it's completely understandable within the context of this world. Yeah, yeah and, and I think magnetism is what Artemisia is. <laughs> I mean, she still is. Yes. And, and she is a magnetic personality, and we've seen that throughout the course of this project, how mm -hmm. so many people respond to her as a figure and um, mm -hmm. her life story, her art, and, and the censorship, for example, there's, there's, there's so many stories that, that form part of her life, but I do think that she managed somehow to bring together um, for this project, you know, so many different players, um, which is what makes it so exciting. And I'm talking about journalists and philanthropists and curators and scientists, technicians, um, really so many people that, that um, are attracted to her magnetism that continues to exist. And I'm, I, it's interesting that she's studying it through painting, you know, thanks to this iconographic program. And I'm, I'm taking you over here to, but to actually see. She was seen to have that inclination. Yes. It was unstoppable, you know. Indeed. She had to, she had to work along the way to learn some things, but like Michelangelo, she couldn't be stopped. Yes, yeah. yes. And there's a, there's a wonderful, uh, just to, to, you mentioned the catalog earlier, and yes. in the catalog, you talk a lot about the compass and this magnetic force and the science that was driving this period, because we're, we're entering into uh, scientific thought and scientific thought in a, in a different way. Um, historically than, than previously, obviously. But also Mary Garrard in the catalog does a wonderful essay, uh, a comparative essay between Michelangelo and Artemisia. And, um, you know, and, and do they have that same drive? You know, and was she in some way um, referencing the master by putting herself as the female nude, we know that the male nude is the, is the key to Western art. Um, so it's interesting that she's working with the female nude here, you know, in, in a different way. But I, I wanted, to, yes. and I'd ask the cameras um, if, if you could please come closer. Um, before we go into the discussion of, of what we're looking at here, um, which are Michelangelo Younger's sketches, I wanted to mention that Casa Bonarotti is a treasure trove of Michelangelo's drawings. Um, and drawing here is very important. As you said, Michelangelo the Younger had copious notes, copious sketches, poetry, etc. But a lot of the works that Michelangelo the Divine didn't burn <laughs> um, because he had the tendency to burn things that he believed were not perfect are actually here at the archives at Casa Buonarroti. So that's something um, that we need to consider yeah. as well. Elizabeth, what are we looking well, at this here? Is this one is a of darling a, sketch. This is one of a whole series of sketches he made. And um, 
it's fascinating to, to, to watch him change his mind and develop his ideas. You see how many times he crosses things out. This isn't a complete design, but you can see here um, the handwriting says Inclinazione, and then in different ink underneath it says Artemisia. And you can see upside down a little stick figure with a star and a compass. But in this case, you can also see little things on the feet, hmm. which are pulleys, like you have in shipping and um, military mechanics and so on, which he, which are, which um, Buonarroti originally thought would be an interesting thing to put on the feet of of um, inclination. And this is one of the areas where I do feel their excitement with Galileo, their friend uh, and colleague, uh, comes into play because Galileo is not only deeply interested in magnetism, but he's also interested in um, pulleys and mechanics and um, gave several lectures on the subject at Pisa uh, in, uh, earlier, in, late in the 16th century. So these, I, th these pulleys would be seen as mechanical ways to help her get up, uh, but obviously visually and conceptually it wasn't a great idea. So, <laughs> so just, just to understand, so the pulleys were the way that the inclination could, could move towards the stars. Yes. It was actually a mechanical process. <laughs> yes. In Artemisia's time, yes. we, we actually we did we did the science we did the science. Uh, we looked at the X-ray. We were hoping yes. to, to see the underdrawing um, yeah. of the pulleys. We didn't find them. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating. But I'm not mistaken to think that she was this was the first work commissioned. Well, she was the first to be signed up. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Among these artists doing um, the scenes around the edges, the allegorical scenes around the edges. Yes. She gets the first down payment. He provided every one of them with a prepared canvas and with um, some ultramarine. Uh, and, um, but she got hers first, yes. Yeah. So it starts with inclination. Uh, more or less, yes. Yes. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you want yes. to tell us a little bit about this document, this ledger. Well, this is another um, just phenomenal treasure uh, for people to come and see the actual words on the page here, which, which we all have read so often about the payments to, to Artemisia. Um, and beginning in 1615, and it's double entry bookkeeping, so it's on, it's on both sides. And um, this might be the moment to raise the question of why was she paid so much more than other people. I would so just she was she was paid three times as much as her as counterparts. Yes, as okay. as the others painting the allegories around okay. the edges. And so I would just say here um, brings us a little bit back to the Academia del Disegno. All of these people were called so and so the Giovane di Biliver, the Giovane di Amanati, no, di um, uh, Allori. Mm -hmm. uh, she's nobody's Giovane at this point. When she arrives, we know that she's a fully fledged painter. She set herself up with her own studio outside her house. She's succeeding in getting this kind of uh, commission from uh, Bonarotti, who wants, I think, to really celebrate her and recognize her. Whereas the others are still all known as Giovane, which is almost a technical term in the academy. And very often the role of the, of the Giovane was to do allegorical uh, images for Medici festivals and mm. for city celebrations. The, they were called festaioli, festival painters. And so that was the job of the Giovane. So the Giovane is young. It's young, but it's also that some of them are almost her age, but it's also still subordinate mm. to a master. And she was not subordinate to a master. And, and that's not just a kind of um, psychological or social statement. It has to do with how much she should be paid. And um, it was right that a painter who was not anybody's Giovane should, 
should get I more. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Artemisia is not anybody's jovane. Let's, <laughs> let's keep it in mind, right? Let's keep it in mind. But um, these, um, just little moment here, and I, I think you came closer already, but this is one of the points at which Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger mentions the fact that Artemisia has asked for some money. Um, she actually says she wants to borrow it and pay him back. And he mentions sending his servant Francesco around with these um, uh, really small amount, this small amount of money, and that Artemisia received them in bed and that she gave him a receipt. This and is then, written here. This is written here, yes. And then it happens again, and he said he sent her a little bit more, that she, she had great need, essendo in parto, meaning she'd just given birth. And um, she needed the money, you know? And she's, this is the middle of trying to get on with this painting. And a lot of things are coming together that are very, very difficult. Um, I, I, Elizabeth, one of the things that most impressed me and, and one of the first things that when we had the opportunity to talk, you and I, um, you told me that, that you actually did research on Artemisia uh, several decades ago. Yes, many decades ago. <laughs> and you discovered her first child, no? her yes. first baptized child. Yes. And, and that is where your research on Artemisia began, yes. right, with her children. Yes. So this is particularly meaningful for Very you. meaningful to me. And, um, you know, it was important because we knew quite a lot about uh, the uh, misfortunes she had in Rome and her social life there. Uh, we know actually not as much as we'd like to about Venice and Naples. But in fact, we had the opportunity to learn a great deal more about her life in Florence if we just looked harder. And people had seen this many, many times. Many people had read this document. But nobody thought, oh, you know, that must mean there is a child somewhere. So I rushed off to the baptistry archives and, and did indeed find, uh, this was her third child, actually, maybe, yes, her third child, uh, little Cristofano, uh, for whom um, uh, Cristofano Allori stood as, as godfather. So, and then from there, I was able to go backwards and forwards and um, find, you know, more children, which was, for me, just increased my regard for her and my sense of um, respect for how she managed to really push through all of this and uh, at some point actually, about, you know, getting rid of the husband and taking a lover and, you know, we, we know a lot more about that than we used to. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. But she had five children and we, yeah. as, that we know yes, of, yes. right? And four died here in Florence were born and died here, um, or did five? She, she had ch ch two surviving children when she went to Rome. Okay. And then Cristofano died almost immediately in Rome, okay. which, as she writes the most painful letter about breaking her heart. Um, I was looking at the baptistry archives, and so I found the baptized children, but um, Sheila Barker, another scholar, went and looked in the... Um, Death's uh, archive, and she found another one, a little girl called Agnola, uh, who was uh, buried before she was baptized. And perhaps we think that's why she was called Agnola. She thought of Michelangelo Buonarroti as compare or godfather. Yeah, and, and that brings us to the next document, yes. but Elizabeth, I, I just oh, want, I want to say I'm, I feel very privileged to be part of this dialogue. <laughs> this dialogue that you've been having with Casa Buonarroti and Artemisia for, for 40 years. Well, and, I've been uh, in very good company too. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit about, we have two documents yes. here. Um, we can start with this one just very briefly yes. and I want to then bring the yes. audience's attention to this, this one. Uh, but, we have some letters. 
Yeah, these are the little notes uh, that he mentions here, little notes that uh, Buonarroti gets, uh, in this case coming from Artemisia's husband, uh, who's writing in September of uh, 1615. Uh, and he writes and he says that, um, you know, um, you know how, how much I've been going through, how difficult it is. He says, quanti disastri io passato, how many disasters I've suffered, um, and could I have some money? And this is the 7th of September, 1615. So this is, she's, you know, going to have a baby in November. Obviously things are not good. Um, in this year also, her father-in-law dies, uh, the husband's father dies, so their household is somewhat disrupted. Mm. Um, and uh, so he's asking Michelangelo Buonarroti almost as a family member and friend to help support them, which brings us to this one, uh, which is, I think, particularly amazing and, and beautiful. And it's not actually dated, uh, but it's clear that it's, you know, it's this moment and she writes to him as uh, Magnifico Signore Compare. And having said what I just said about the little girl, Agnola, Godfather is a rather elastic term at this moment. It, it may literally mean that you stood at the baptismal font and held the baby, but it can also mean a wider range of um, not biological family, but social family. And so you can have a compare who perhaps was not a godfather, but someone you feel very close to. And obviously in the absence of her own father, her own mother, her husband's not much help. She thinks of him as her compare. And she writes to him to ask if she could have uh, some lire, which she, she says, I will pay them back to you as soon as I can. And signs it in most affectionately Come filiola, as if I were your daughter. Um, Artemisia Lomi, very, very important, her name. And uh, just a note that was then folded up, there's probably an address on the other side. Um, no date, but across time, we know exactly what's going on. And that's really extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank and it's you. so nice yeah. to, to <laughs> And on a note of affection, yes, um, because I do think that the inclination to study someone like Artemisia uh, brings you to feel an affection towards the artist and esteem. Uh, I do think it's the guiding force. Uh, but I wanted to move here, move in front of the painting, because yes. I'm hoping that um, our guests tonight have some questions for us. And at this point, I need to... Um, Check here. See Hopefully, we'll have in. some <laughs> some interesting uh, ideas or wondering. And and I also wanted to have a look at. Um, excuse me, just one second. Okay, so let's see. Um, what is the most, this is, let's see here, this is from, oh, from Finland. From we Finland. have a question from Helsinki, oh, Finland, uh, from Thea Pelkonen. That's exciting. Um, what is the most important thing you learned during this project about Artemisia and her life? Perhaps that's a question for you. <laughs> oh goodness. You could both um, answer it. <laughs> yeah. The mm. most important thing I learned f about Artemisia. Mm. Probably that her life was documented. Um, it's documented in the archival documents that we've seen. Um, there's also Elizabeth Wicks, the restorer, found her thumbprint. Uh, those with good eyes can, can look at her calf. There's a thumbprint yes. of Artemisia, which is, is quite exciting. But um, I think what I learned is the mark that she has made on, on our lives today. Uh, that's what I most respond to. 
the fact that people feel very strongly about her. Uh, the public came on Fridays throughout the, 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 prog the, the process and spoke with the restorer, Elizabeth Wicks. And, and some people came to say they'd come on a, on a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And some people were reduced to tears to see the inclination. So I've become quite a crybaby <laughs> in this, uh, with this project. But uh, it, it's, I think what I've learned is that there is, there is a bridge. And, and we're on it. <laughs> right? We're on it with, um, with Artemisia and with her fellows as well. And we continue that, um, you know, through the, the recovery and, and, and rescuing the achievements of women, um, which is something that, that this project has definitely taught me. You want to answer? <laughs> well, um, just very briefly, I suppose uh, I would say that I've always found this Florentine period particularly fascinating um, when she sort of becomes Artemisia. She's always Artemisia, but gives her opportunity to become a professional painter, to be creative, to be appreciated, um, and establish herself. And I think I thought I knew everything about that, but there's always more to find out, and more to find out about the potential relationships with people in Florence and the world of um, Christina of Lorraine and um, you know and her son and his wife uh, it's a really important and fascinating moment and I've thought about that a lot more than I had before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see let's go to another question. Uh, Margaret Ann Zallow is it possible that part of the issue with the nudity of the figure, inclination, is related to the placement on the ceiling, mm. i.e. above the viewer as opposed to eye level? Oh, wow. Um, well, I suppose the fact that it's in the ceiling, none of these have the kind of um, perspective you would expect in a Baroque ceiling. They are paintings, quadri riportati, they are paintings taken up there. They're not painted from a perspective of below. But the fact that they are permanently installed means that you cannot, as if you, know, you were Vincenzo Giustiniani putting a little curtain across his Caravaggio, uh, you couldn't do that. And we know that when Michelangelo Buonarroti, the youngest nephew, took possession of the place. Uh, he was worried that his wife and his children, or maybe his wife was worried, uh, were seeing this all the time. And that's why he wanted the, the nudity, such as it was, uh, covered up. So I don't think it has anything to do with angle of vision, but it has to do with the fact that it was always on view. Mm. Interesting. Um, we have another question from Susan Castle. You have spoken of the historic significance. As someone who has studied art, uh, Elizabeth, where do you place the inclination as significance of the work of art? In the history of things? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's... Um, it's a great masterpiece by Artemisia, and I think that we see that now in ways that perhaps the general public couldn't, couldn't see it before because they hadn't been here and couldn't really sort of appreciate it. But um, in Artemisia's work, if I took the early Susanna and the Elders, the Inclination and the Pity Magdalene, I think that's a pretty stupendous uh, group of works and um, I don't think I can begin to put it in a global context <laughs> but that's next year <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, we have a question from Florida let's see Denise from Florida uh, she's referring to the star yes 
And she says, I've heard another theory that it is a planet and not a star. Thoughts? <laughs> yes, I have thoughts. Um, maybe word gets out very quickly, but in her wonderful essay for the volume, uh, Christina Accidini um, has made a proposal that it is in fact not the North Star, but um, perhaps Jupiter, and she has an astrological uh, explanation for that. Um, I think I'm right, but I'm sure she does too. Uh, That's the fun of it. <laughs> yes. I think it's more uh, likely, given the presence of the compass, that the compass is steering us towards the star. Yeah. But it's a fascinating proposal. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I would like to introduce you to Artemisia up close, take the opportunity. This is um, a, a, a new book by the Florentine Press, and obviously Elizabeth is one of the contributors, um, as is Cristina Cidini, who is the president of Casa Buonarroti, Mary Gerard as well, Elizabeth Wicks, the conservator, and Margie McKinnon, um, who is the co-founder of Calliope Arts. But definitely this, um, this is available. And my favorite thing, um, because I, I did have the opportunity to, to edit the book, but my favorite thing is the dialogue. So the, the, the ability of art historians to come together and, and have a conversation, which restoration conversations, um, to really bring new ideas, new considerations to light. Um, I wanted to end, Elizabeth, if you wouldn't mind, we'll go see the compass. Yes, because the I compass. know this is a, a really important part of your own essay. Um, yes. And I, it also gives us the opportunity to see the whole room. And I do, yes. I do want to give a shout out also to Massimo Chimenti, who was the, the um, the designer of the show on a, physical, yeah. on a physical level and, and, and really um, my complimenti from that point of view because I do think that, that he achieved a jewel box exhibition. Yeah, but can you tell us, this is from Museo Galileo, this our friends at Museo Galileo. Um, yeah, and it's made of brass and you can sort of imagine um, the, the name in Italian, bussola, comes from box, which means originally perhaps uh, they were made of wood, um, but this is one that um, is dated here late 17th, early 18th century. They're quite rare, actually, um, in originals. I, I found a couple at the Maritime Museum in uh, Greenwich, but it's a very simple one, and you can see the, the pin in the center and the magnetic um, versarium. Uh, sometimes they would have a rose, a printed rose with the points of the compass um, printed, printed on it. Um, if I might just give one little shout out for the magnet, there, there was a very important book published in 1600 by an English philosopher called um, uh, Gilbert William, and he made lots of proposals about uh, compasses and magnetism, which spread throughout Europe really fast and Galileo wanted all the latest news and um, also he wanted the Medici to start a collection of lodestones which of course are magnetic stones so if you go to the um, museum, that's, that's our time <laughs> that's our time go to the Museo Galileo and look at all these wonderful instruments that the Medici collected and I know your your conversation there was about art and science and creativity. I think this one is also. Elizabeth, thank you so much. I, I do want to um, give a final thanks to you, to Casa Bonarotti. Um, it's a pleasure and it's been a privilege to be here. I want to thank the sponsors of the exhibition first and foremost, Calliope Arts, Christian Levitt, Alessandro Cecchi, the curator of the museum, the president, Cristina Cidini. It's been an absolute pleasure. And our audience as well, because we know uh, that they're sitting on the edge of their seats, right? <laughs> to see Artemisia in the Museum of Michelangelo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Grazie. you. <laughs>